Welcome to New Morning Light Baptist Church's virtual worship experience. We may not be in the sanctuary, however, we still have this virtual platform in which we can worship and praise our Lord and Savior. So before we get started, make sure you prepare your heart, make sure you prepare your mind and your spirit to truly be able to have a full encounter with God. We don't take this moment lightly, despite us not having the traditional worship experience. We're going to make the new norm what we're experiencing right now through this virtual platform. So I thank you for joining and let us prepare our hearts and minds for what thus says the word of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, New Morning Light. Just want to welcome you to our service this morning. This is our call to worship. I'm Deacon Wallace Williams. Father, we just want to uh, be in service with the be with the service this morning. We're gonna first do our scripture reading from First uh, Timothy, starting at the eleventh verse. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, goodness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We let us go into prayer now. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to thank you for all you've done. Father God, we just want to show you how much we love you. Father God, we thank you for all things that you've done, are doing, and going to do. Father God, we thank you for giving us a place to worship, to show you how much we care about you. Father God, we thank you. We want you to continue to bless us as we go through our daily routine, Father God. Father God, thank you for all things. Father God, bless this church, bless our pastor, bless each and every one connected to us, Father God. Bless this community, Father. Father God, we just want to praise your name. We thank you for all things that you've done. And Father God, we know better things are coming. We thank you for these and all the other blessings in your son Jesus' name. We do pray. Amen.
Brothers of New Morning Light Baptist Church, good morning. I'm Reverend Eugene Williams. And first I want to bring you, G I want to greet you with Jesus joy and bring you greetings from the Ray of Hope Christian Church, where our founder and senior pastor is none other than the Reverend Dr. Cynthia L. Hale. I want to take a moment to thank my friend, my brother, uh, Pastor Charles Hamilton for having me back to spend some time with you all to uh, break open the, the, the word of life. Um, and to see what thus saith the Lord uh, for us this morning. Um, thank you, Pastor Hamilton, for trusting me uh, and giving me this opportunity uh, to share with you all this morning. If you'll go with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the Gospel according to John, uh, will be in the eighth chapter, verses 31 through 36. The Gospel according to John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard uh, translation of the Bible. John chapter 8, 31 through 36, the New Revised Standard translation. It reads this way. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the sun makes you free, you will be free indeed. I want to talk with you and preach with you for the next few moments uh, from the thought made free. Made free. Pray with me, please. Holy and all wise God, we are so grateful for granting us another opportunity to come before your throne of grace. To stand behind your sacred desk to open up your word of life that we may find treasures that will be beneficial and edifying for us. Lord, right now I pray that you would hide me behind your cross. I pray that you would breathe on my words and make them yours. Lord, I pray that you get all the glory and all of the honor. I pray that you and everyone else knows that all the mistakes are mine, but that God will be glorified. Lord Jesus, in the next few moments, let something be said or done that would draw everyone unto thee, that would have, have me introduce some soul to the Savior, and that they would come asking what must I do to be saved? It is in Jesus' name that I do pray. Amen. Amen. Made free. In 1875, the renowned British poet William Ernest Henley, he wrote a poem entitled Invictus. Now even to this day, many people have come to know this poem. Now, some of us have come to learn this poem uh, through the initiation processes of our black Greek lettered organizations. I had to learn it when I pledged Omega, and I'm sure Pastor Hamilton had to learn it when he pledged Alpha. But some of us may have learned it a different way. Some of us may have learned it from Nelson Mandela. If you've ever studied President Mandela's life or you simply watched one of the movies about him, I was watching uh, in a movie by the same title, Invictus, the other day. But you have come to learn Invictus if you've studied President Mandela. When South African people were oppressed under the apartheid regime, when he was wrongfully imprisoned for over 27 years, it was this poem, Invictus, that helped him, helped him to retain his internal strength, that kept him in his right mind for his long walk to freedom. You see, the poem says, out of the night that covers me, black 
as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced or cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied, but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate, and I am the captain of my soul. You see, th this poem focuses on the human spirit. It focuses on the ability of the human spirit to overcome adversity. It's, it's, a, it's a rallying cry for those of us who find ourselves in dark and trying situations. For those of us who have to dig deep and to fight uh, for, our, for our lives uh, against all odds and against all oppression in order to be free from that which has us bound. The poet certainly knew hard times and he needed all of his strength to battle uh, against sickness and disease. You see, at the age of 12, he was diagnosed with tubercular arthritis. And he went through years of pain and discomfort. And even while he was still a, a young man, Henley's left leg had to be amputated in order to, in order to treat his condition of tuberculosis of the bones. While, now, while he was recovering in his hospital bed, he wrote this poem, Invictus. Now, his, his personal experience on the operating table and in a hospital bed and after facing possible death certainly helped him to create one of the most popular poems in the English language. The, the poem helps us to understand the strength and the resiliency of the human spirit in our ultimate quest to be free. Yet in our text today, Jesus is explaining uh, to a group of Jews who had recently come to believe in him about what it means to be truly, to truly be a disciple and how we can really be free. Just a few days prior to this moment in the text, Jesus has had secretly come into Jeris Jerusalem for the festival of booths. And in the middle of the festival, he began uh, preaching and teaching in the temple. They, there were those who heard his teachings and were skeptical of what he was saying. The religious leaders, the, the Pharisees, they, they were definitely against him and they rejected him and all that he taught. And they even sent the temple guard to arrest him. But there were many among the crowds. And there were even some amongst the religious leadership who heard Jesus' teachings and would come to believe in his word. Jesus takes this moment to make it plain to the believers that if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. In other words, Jesus tells us that the mark of a true disciple is one who remains faithful. Let me say it again. The, one, the mark of a true disciple is one who remains faithful. The first stanza of Henley's poem says, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. Jesus is telling the new believers in our text and, and he's teaching us today that we must persevere in the word of God. In spite of darkness, uh, in spite of the darkness of life that may surround us at times, it, it, it's key that we that we always study and remember the life and the lessons of Jesus Christ. It is through our understanding, it is through our interpretation of who Jesus really is that we will become true disciples. We must study to show ourselves approved. In in the text, they came to believe in Him uh, as the promised Messiah. The one who, who they thought would be uh, anointed and sent by God to restore the kingdom of Israel. However, Jesus teaches us that he was anointed and sit, sent by God to do so much more than to restore the kingdom of Israel back to its former glory. But he came to be the light of the world. He said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In his initial sermon, Jesus stood up in the synagogue full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And he read from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to, to let the oppressed go free, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, sat down, looked around and declared, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus is saying then, Jesus is saying now that he came to set the world free. And if those of us who believe in him remain faithful to his words, remain faithful to his example, remain faithful to his mission, then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now, the predominant and pervasive interpretation of Christianity that is, that, is, that is white, that is Western, that is imperialistic, that interpretation that is capitalistic and hegemonic and patriarchal and homophobic and transphobic and misogynistic is not the faith that will set anyone free. It is not the faith of Jesus Christ. In fact, it, it, in fact that is a belief. Uh, that type of faith, that type of believing, that type of, uh, of understanding and interpretation is a belief that only keeps people bound to this false notion of white American exceptionalism. Now, my, my, my seminary professor, Dr. Noel Erskine, would say that that's not Christianity, but it's Americanity. It's not a faith that sets people free, but it in fact keeps people bound to hate. But thanks be to God that the, that the word that became flesh and dwelt among us as a brown-skinned Palestinian Jew, uh, he came uh, as, as one who was oppressed to make it clear that God is on the side of the oppressed and he came to set the oppressed captives free. He taught us that if we remain faithful to him and if we persevere in his words, then we will know the truth and the truth will make us free. The poet said, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. William Ernest Henley may have been unclear or uncertain about, about where his strength and his unconquerability came from. But we as believers believe in a risen Christ. And we know that our human spirit is resilient only because of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. So when I say this poem to myself, when I need it to remind me, I always say that first stanza. I thank the God that is. For my unconquerable soul. Brothers and sisters, the first question is easy. The first question is, what, what is the truth? You know the truth. As Christians, we understand the truth to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've heard that before. We, we know the truth to be the revealed word of God in this world. And, and if we are to be truly, uh, we are, if we are truly to be disciples, then we must know the truth. We must read the truth. We must internalize the truth. We must ingest it and digest it so that ultimately we will be able to live the truth. If we know the truth, then the truth will make us free. Then the second question, the second question, my friends, uh, it can be a little harder for us to answer. It requires us to, to, to have a little introspection and, and self-awareness. It requires honesty, honesty, uh, honesty with self and honesty with God. To answer the second question, brothers and sisters, we must look beyond ourselves and our present circumstances. To answer the second question, our eyes have to be wide open. We know we will know the truth and the truth will make us free. But the second question is, my friends, what do we need to be set free from? The poet wrote in his second stanza. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. The truth is, is that Jesus, God with us, Emmanuel, is the one who makes our souls unconquerable. It is in the truth of the, of the gospel that we can find our strength to endure. And it is because of this revealed truth that we stand unbowed by the circumstances of the world that we find ourselves in. However, this truth does not mean that we have never been in and that we, will never, we won't ever be or find ourselves in the fell clutch of circumstances sometimes. The Jews who had come to believe in Jesus in this, in this teachings responded to him, we are descendants of Abraham and we have never been slaves to anyone. What, what, what are you talking about, Jesus, when you say that, 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 that you will be made free? What do you mean by that? I read that and I said they must have forgotten. They must have forgotten who, who, who they actually were and they must have forgotten their history. And I wonder how often we forget our circumstances. I wonder how often we like to forget our own past and our own history. But that's 
Another sermon for another day. These, the, these believers were responding to Jesus, uh, who were responding to Jesus, were not fully aware, or they chose to, chose to not be fully aware of what had them bound. So Jesus gently reminds them that, that, that you are all slaves, every last one of you. You are all slaves to sin, every one of you. Jesus highlights that there is no way that anyone can say that they are truly free or that they are truly a disciple and still not acknowledge that they are bound by sin. On that Roman road to salvation, uh, uh, the first thing that I read was that all have sinned and, and come short of the glory of God. Jesus says that if you're going to be made free, if you're going to be truly unconquerable, then, 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 you, then you need to open your eyes to the fact that there is something that has you bound uh, and that you need to be set free from. If you have uh, faith in Jesus enough, you should confess your sins. The Bible tells us to confess our sins and, and he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus set us free from the power of sin and, and our individual and daily transgressions. They're different. Sin is a power. Sin is its own entity. The things that we do every day, they are sins, but they are transgressions. But Jesus has set us free from the entity of sin. That is where, that is where the introspection and the, and, and, and the self-awareness must begin in regards to what we need to be set free from. I can tell you, I can tell you that I, I need to be set free from, from, from none of your business. <laughs> I need to be set free from none of your business. Like Psalm 51, I know my transgressions and, and my sin is ever before me. Normally, the preacher would tell you to look at your neighbor, but in this moment, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to ask you to, to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, what do I need to be set free from? What has me bound? What sin has me trapped, trapped in a cycle of guilt and shame? What transgression is pulling me away from the presence of God? Ask yourself, what, it is going, what is it going to take to get back into the presence of the Lord? Because the Bible says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lord, we need to be set free. We need to be set free like the people in the text. We need to be set free from the power of sin and we need to be set free from the power of our own personal transgressions. But not only that, we need to be set free from the systemic sin of injustice and oppression. It's interesting. It's interesting to me that the Jews that are speaking to Jesus in this text can say that they have never been slaves to anyone. Reverend Dr. Mitri Raheb, uh, uh, he tells us that, that every part of their story has been written under some form of occupation and oppression. They were oppressed by the Jews. They were slaves in Egypt. They were oppressed by, by, by the Assyrians. They were oppressed by the Babylonians. They were oppressed by the Persians, the Greeks. And when they, when they are, are, are saying this uh, to Jesus, they are under Roman oppression and, and, and occupation at that very moment. How can they say that they've never been slaves when they've always been slaves? Not only uh, were, they, were they blind to their own sin, but they were blind to the systemic sins of injustice and oppression that were being perpetrated against them and keeping them trapped in the, in the caste system of their day. It's been said that those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. Friends, that's why the West African concept of Sankofa is so important uh, for us. It literally, it literally means to, to go back and get it. In other words, it means that we should always be reaching back into the past to get the lessons uh, that are going to keep us uh, in progress, that are going to help us to progress uh, in, in the present and in the future. Knowing our past is important because we can draw strength and understanding for where, we're, where we are and where we're going if we reach back and get it. In this country today, we find ourselves still in the fell clutch of circumstance, under the bludgeonings of chance. We are in the tight grasp. We are in the chokehold of weaponized white supremacy, pol policing systems that, uh, that have never been designed to protect us or to serve us. We are constantly traumatized and re-traumatized by the replaying of the same story day in and day out with the different characters every day. 
In the last few weeks, we have, we have had to relive the murder of George Floyd in our minds day in and day out, over and over again as we, as we watch the trial of his murderer. While we were watching that, we, we, we had to witness the brutal assault uh, of a black army officer, uh, Karan Nazario, in Virginia by, by police officers there. Before, before we could finish reeling from that, uh, we, we were traumatized once again by the news of a Minnesota police officer murdering D Dante Wright. Before we could find a way to cope with that, we, we watched uh, with rage as a white staff sergeant in the army bullied and assaulted a black teenager whom he thought did not belong in his neighborhood. Before we could even rally behind that cause, the, 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 the body cam footage is released uh, of, of, of the Chicago police officer who ran down and murdered a 13-year-old seventh grader named Adam Toledo. Before we could even cry about that, the sickening news, the evil uh, of capitalistic enterprise reared its ugly head when we found out that one of the officers that assassinated Breonna Taylor as she slept in her bed is getting paid in a book deal to write about how he did it. We are in the fell clutch of circumstance. We are in the under the bludgeonings of chance. We're in the fell clutch of circumstance of systems that have no regard for the humanity of black people or other people of color in this nation. Though we are strong and resilient, though the black man is strong and the black woman is strong, collectively we are stuck. We are trapped, we are captive, we are bound and imprisoned in, in a sinful system. And unfortunately, some of us don't, can't, or won't even see it or acknowledge it. We so desperately need to be free. We need to be free from the extreme violence and the, and the destruction that, ha, that has been and is still being wrought against us. But the question is, how? Killer Mike, he tells us that we need to cooper cooperatively plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. We need to do all that for our people towards uh, our common goals, and, and I agree with that. In 1964, in an Oxford Union debate, Malcolm X said, we're living in a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when, it, when there's got to be a change. The people in, the people in power have, have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built. And the only way it's going to be built is with extreme methods. And I, for one, will join with him, with anyone. I don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. That was Malcolm in 1964. His words ring absolutely true to this day. And like him, I believe that we need to join with anyone who, will, who can help us to bring about change, about the change that we seek to create. I believe that the first partner we need, uh, we need to partner with someone uh, who can set us free. Who can set us free from the condition that we find ourselves in internally and externally. Jesus tells the crowd and he tells us that, that, that they are slaves to sin and he opens our eyes to the fact that we need to be free. I like how the Living Bible paraphrases verse 35. Uh, 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 Jesus says, uh, and slaves don't have rights, but the son has every right there is. In this country, we've always fought for our rights as we, as, as we fight for, for, for justice and equitable treatment. As we fight against poverty and the criminalization of poverty, as, as we are in the struggle to create and build a new world that eradicates the miserable condition that still exists on earth. As we simply cry out for respect of our human rights, as we simply cry out and say that our lives matter and we're looking to be respected as human beings with human rights, we must do so leaning on the strength of the Son who has every natural right, human right, and every kind of other high right in the palm of his hand. In the third stanza, Henley wrote, uh, Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. Here's the hope, friends, as we desire to be free, 
and to live and, and to work towards building a new world that is in the likeness of the kingdom of God. Those things that loom beyond, what looms beyond this, this current nation and what looms beyond this current world may seem uncertain to us. It may seem uncertain to the people who would be against us. But if we connect ourselves, if we connect our lives and our plans to the sun, uh, then the menace of the uncertainty that looms will not cause us to be afraid of chasing after our freedom. Listen. Listen, I, I, I have to be honest with you all. I, I've been saying something wrong for the entire message. I've been saying something wrong for the entire message. I've been saying that we need to be set free. I've been saying that, that, that Jesus can set us free. Makes sense. Sounds good. But I've made the mistake that, 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 that everyone, that most of us make when we quote this text. I, I have been saying if the sun sets you free, then you will be free indeed, set free. But the text, but the text does not say that. Accurate translations of the verse 36, uh, they say that if the sun makes you free, you will be free indeed. If the sun makes you free, there's a difference in being set free and being made free. And any of us can set something free. How can I make it plain for you? If, if you had a childhood like mine, on summer evenings you would go out, you would go outside with a jar and you, and you would catch uh, uh, fireflies. We, we used to call them lightning bugs. But whatever you called them, if, 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 you caught, uh, if you caught them to see them light up your jar as the sun was going down, before you went back inside after it got dark, you, you should have set the lightning bugs free. You should have set them free so they did so that they didn't die in the jar. Now I don't I don't, I don't know what y'all did, but 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 before I went back inside, I, I, I would set them free. I would I would set the lightning bugs free because I had the ability to set them free. We fight so hard. Uh, against the unjust systems that, uh, that have been that, uh, that have so many black people and other people of color bound and imprisoned because uh, we can we can do something to set them free. We should be doing something to set them free. But Jesus is different. He can set the captives free and we are commissioned to, 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 to continue his work to set the captives free. But we can only do so much, brothers and sisters. The text tells us that that Jesus can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ever ask or imagine. This, this text doesn't, doesn't say that the sun will set you free, but that the sun will make us free. God has the ability to make us into something and to someone that is completely new. The Bible tells us that therefore, if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. So the prayer that I cry out with you today and I pray that you're praying this with me. The prayer is that I want to be made free. I want to be made free from sin and free from sinful systems and free from injustice and free from oppression, free from addiction, freedom from rage, free from abuse, freedom from toxic relationships, free from depression, free from self-loathing, free from suicidal thoughts, freedom from jealousy and envy and strife, freedom from the wiles, the tricks and the schemes of the enemy. Jesus told us that if the sun makes you free, you will be free indeed. If the sun makes you free, you will be free. I, I, I didn't tell you something. I said I should have told you in the beginning, but I'm going to tell you now. The word invictus is a Latin word that means unconquerable. If Jesus makes us free, then he makes us unconquerable. What do you mean, E.P.? Uh, what I mean is that we will never be able to be conquered by the things that once had us bound. If Jesus makes us free, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed, and you will never be bound by it again. The last stanza of the poem, Invictus. It says, it matters not how straight the gate, 
How charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. And I am the captain of my soul. Friends, if, 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 if you believe in the human spirit, if you believe in the resiliency of the human spirit, that's good. That makes sense. I am the master of my fate, and I am the captain of my soul. That's true. That's well and good. But brothers and sisters, if you believe in the power of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit, then how much more of a difference, how much more resilient could you be if you took, if you took your fate, if you took your soul and gave it over to Jesus? Friends, that's what I want to invite you to do now. Some of you may be hearing this message for the very first time. This message of the gospel, this message that Jesus is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Some of you may be hearing this for the first time and, and you want to know more about Jesus. You want to dedicate your life to this gospel ministry. You want to know Jesus and have Jesus be your Lord and Savior. This is your time. This is your time, your opportunity to say, yes, Lord, I yield, I yield. This is your opportunity to come saying, what must I do to be saved? I want to tell you, friends, that salvation really is simple. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 tells, that it tells us that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you shall be saved. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. It's that simple. If you want to give your life to Jesus, pray the simple prayer with me. If you want to come to know Christ, if you want to know Jesus, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I love you. I need you to come into my life and make me free. Make me unconquerable. Lord, I confess all of my sins and I believe that you are faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord, I confess that you are Lord and Savior. And I believe that God raised you from the dead on that resurrection morning. And that you are alive to lead me and to guide me even today. Lord Jesus, my fate, my soul, my life is yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Friends, if you prayed that simple prayer, you are saved. If you want to join and connect with this church, New Morning Light Baptist Church, this is a wonderful place to, to, to be and to grow. The people here are wonderful. Pastor Hamilton would love to be your pastor. Call the church, get connected, and walk with people who want to walk with you. We love you. God bless you. You have been made free. Amen. Church family, thank you again for joining us for communion. And as we've done so many times before, we are here with our bread and we are here with our blood, which is symbolic of the blood and body of Jesus Christ. Now, this is one of the oldest traditions that we have in our Christian tradition. Brothers and sisters, this is symbolic of the actual blood and body of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed on the cross. Isaiah tells us that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. 
It is by those stripes that we receive the blood. It is by those stripes that we receive the body. And it is by those stripes that we are reminded of the seriousness and of the traumatic experience of our Savior being beaten and killed at the cross. So brothers and sisters, we partake in this so that we don't take salvation lightly, so that we don't take the grace of God lightly, so that as we eat and we drink the symbolic blood, blood and body of our Savior Jesus Christ, we eat and drink this as a reminder as we go through life that we need to take each step seriously as a Christian and in our Christian faith. I just preached about being in right relationship with God. And brothers and sisters, this is our direct connection to keep our mind in right relationship with God. So at this time, I hope you have your bread prepared and I hope you have whatever element you have that you're going to drink. And we will partake in communion. Matthew's gospel tells us that he took the body, he broke it, and he said, eat but this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that was shed for you for the remission of sins. Take and drink, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, at this time, after taking communion and after reflecting over the traumatic experience of the cross, Take that experience with you and take this communion with you through the remainder of your week so that you can be intentional about having the right relationship with God. We don't want to have cheap grace. We don't want to have cheap salvation. Cheap in the sense of us not necessarily valuing all that was sacrificed at the cross. But the sacrifice at the cross was the ultimate sacrifice, which is death. And brothers and sisters, we are reminded of the death of our Savior and his resurrection through partaking in communion. Now say with me, as we always say in our statement of faith, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. I am thankful for what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. God bless you, brothers and sisters, and have a safe and healthy week. Church family, we've reached the part of the service where you can now participate, and that's through the giving of your tithes and offerings. We have three ways to give. That's through downloading the Easy Tides app and finding New Morning Light Baptist Church as a church to give to, visiting our church website, or through text to give. Always remember the Bible tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. And remember, you're not paying God, but we're showing God how much we appreciate His glory and His grace. Always keep in mind that your financial contributions help maintain the kingdom of God established here through the work we do here at New Morning Light Baptist Church. Once again, we thank you and your pastor loves you, and God bless you.